unfortunately in the last few years, especially in the United States, um, with the growing polarization in politics that we have, but I'm sure in other places in the world too, the word fascism is thrown around at anything you vaguely dislike. And because of that, it's become a, a more obscure word than I guess it really should be. And uh, this book, I'm not sure if it really sets out to, to fix that problem, but it actually does a really good job at inadvertently fixing that problem. Uh, the book is called uh, The Anatomy of Fascism by Robert O. Paxton. And Robert O. Paxton is, um, I don't think he is anymore, but he was at Columbia for another for, for a number of years and also wrote um, Vichy France and uh, Vichy France and the Jews, which uh, has all, have also been recommended to me um, by, by being very good in their own right. Um, Il Gatto Pardo by uh, Giuseppe di Lampedusa said of the Sicilian nobility that if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. Robert Paxton uh, asserts much the same uh, that can be said for the scholarship of fascism throughout the 20th century. Uh, he has a really insightful analysis of the rise entrenchment and political development of this body of, of political movements uh, in Europe. Instead of arguing that fascism is of the left or of the right, which are usual prescriptions of the word, Paxson both escapes these narrow confines while at the same time detailing why these categories are woefully inadequate. Uh, the book also considers fascism's development chronologically. First, he looks at the prerequisites, then how it takes root, how it gains power, and finally how it ex exercises that power. It should be noted here that the only two regimes Paxton considers in detail are those of Hitler and Mussolini. Others are mentioned in passing, but the deepest, most telling lessons are drawn from those two. Throughout most of the 19th century, politics was the business of the educated elite. The common man was often disenfranchised from the most important parts of the political process. It wasn't until the masses full of beer and nonsense, as uh, Thomas Carlyle once uh, famously and acerbically noted, were fully integrated into the political sphere that fascism was possible. Also, as a side note, since I've read and reviewed, done the written review for this book, uh, there's another uh, book by George L. Moss called, um, it has it, Western Nationalisms, I want to say. It's an essay collection. I reviewed, I've reviewed it on here. Just search Moss, M-O-S-S-E. And the review will pop right up. I think it's called uh, Nationalisms or Western Nationalisms. And there's a really, really good essay in there about um, the French Revolution and how, in many important ways, the French Revolution made movements like fascism possible because it mobilized mass groups of people into the political process. Here's a really good essay on it that details some of that. Fascism is often associated with um, any of a number of ideological stances, from anti-capitalism to anti-socialism, but maybe most commonly anti-Semitism. You know, Paxton attempts to show that no one, no one fascist regime, regime espoused all of these ideas at the same time. That's to say, none of the sort of stereotypical ideas. For example, while fascists often did attack bourgeois capitalists for their flabby materialism, once they gained power, they often joined powers with them later in order to build political alliances. In fact, fascist hardliners usually fancied themselves as apolitical and refused to engage in decadent liberal parliamentarianism. 
Of course, as history continually tells us, purity is no way to gain political power or legitimacy. It's simply not enough to don a colored shirt and start beating up foreigners and minorities. Paxton describes how fully realized fascist mobilization took what he calls a comparable crisis, a comparable opening of political space, a comparable skill at alliance building, and comparable cooperation from existing elites. Paxson states that in the long term, all fascist regimes eventually devolve through a period of entropy in which they slough off their purest elements and become something much more resembling authoritarians than fascists. He refers to this as their period of entropy, whereby they undergo a kind of political and cultural normalization along the lines of uh, political elites and, and forming alliances with people that they can actually get accomplished, that they can actually accomplish things with. He claims that the one regime that did not undergo this phase was Hitler's Germany, the next to last chapter considers fascisms or fascist-like regime, regimes in other parts of the world, especially uh, Perón's Argentina. All of this is meant as a series of lessons which should enable us to, in the end, limb some, some of the fascisms, some of fascism's defining characteristics. Uh, his final analysis concludes that most successful fascisms have several common themes. Some of them include a sense of overwhelming crisis or the uh, primacy of the group and the subordination of the individual to it, or dread of the group's decline under the corrosive effects of individualism and liberalism, or another one still, the superiority of the leader's instinct over abstract and universal reason or the beauty of violence and the efficacy of the will. Again, you can find regimes which uh, more or less line up with one or maybe two of those, but certainly not all of them, since some of them are uh, internally contradictory. While these aspects might not provide us with the fullest picture of fas fascism, those phrases that I just listed, it seems... Uh, to provide a good baseline for the scholarship uh, past and, and future. Uh, for a while, around the time that I was writing this review, I had been reading, um, I guess, around the subject of fascism, especially uh, William Johnson's really, really um, interesting book called The Austrian Mind, An Intellectual and Social History, 1848 to 1938. And I found, well, Johnson's book, just to, to say a word about it, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there, but it's also dry as hay. It's, it's a slog of a book, but there's a lot of fascinating uh, material in there if you're interested in it. Um, I found Paxson's book really valuable in providing the material to connect some really important dots as far as setting the political tone for the possibility of fascism especially since, you know, being, being concerned with Austria and being concerned with the late 19th and very early 20th century, uh, you get to see how these ideas can coalesce into something like um, fascist politics. Also, one of the most wonderful uh, resources in this book, The Anatomy of Fascism, is the 30-page topically organized bibliographical essay. So, um, and I mean, he the, he's pretty thorough, as you can tell, 30 pages. So if you're interested in reading up on the source material in any one country, or, of course, you know, the literature about Mussolini and, and Hitler is, you know, could fill libraries. But there's also uh, smaller, more marginal topics you might want to look up. Uh, and the bibliographical essay is a great place to do that. Um, really interesting book. Learned a lot. Um, the Anatomy of Fascism by Robert O. Paxton.